the PC Gaming Week Spot, your recap of the last seven days in PC video gaming. My name is Colin Mahern, and joining me this week, five, four, three, two, one. Oh no, it can't be. <gasps> Ladies and gentlemen, it is. It's Matthew Castle. Hello. Hi, Matthew. How are you? What a shocker. It's me. Mm, indeed. No, this cultural reference, I mean, it's not really a cultural reference. It's a re that sounds like, is that a wrestling thing? Oh, Matthew, two for two this week. Well done. Yes, indeed. Uh, it was the Royal Rumble event on Sunday evening, uh, mm. uh, which is, I feel like the one wrestling event that your general public can get behind because it's quite an easy thing to understand and it's exciting because you're getting that's, new people all the time and old people. But that's, and that's that. wrestlers versus members of the royal family, right? Uh, correct. Yes, indeed. Um, Liz herself showed up this year. It was all and very did, exciting. Did Triple H just throw her out of the ring? Is yeah, he still a thing? With gusto. He is still a thing. Well, you see, the, the person who won the Royal Rumble this year is very much like an old school person. I mean, spoilers if you haven't is seen it, the Royal Rumble it, by it, now. But... <laughs> <laughs> He's as old school as it comes. <laughs> um, not quite as old school as Prince Philip. Um, it is, uh, do you remember Edge? Is Edge a name be... that rings a bell? Not yeah, the guitarist yeah, um, from yeah. the U2? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, he won, which was, you know, very exciting. Uh, he had long hair. He did have, and he still does. Still, he, mm. he looks very well for his more senior age in terms of wrestling. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think who else was in it that you might remember. Randy Orton, although he's still a regular. Oh, I know person. the name. Yeah, yeah. It's all fair. It's very exciting. I couldn't, I couldn't like draw him, but I know the name. <laughs> you, could Could you draw Edge? Is that a? Oh, I would give it a go. And and Triple H and well, like I mean, you you have Triple H is just like a big muscly dude. I mean, that's a lot of quite them, small, to be fair. Does he have quite a small face? No, I'd say he's quite a quite a large... I mean, famously a very large nose. Um, oh. I mean, that, that's what the face you were doing there is quite... Tri when Triple H is cross, it's quite... It's quite, it's quite small eyes. <laughs> um, I'm going to chuck you out the ring, my friend! And he, 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 do, he does this brilliant thing where he gets water and he spits it all over the place. It's... Oh. No, in the age of COVID, oh, come on, man! <laughs> How many of them have had to change their shtick because of COVID? Uh, ooh, good question. Is uh, there one that like infamously like coughs in people's faces and he's not allowed to do it anymore? No, but there is, for example, a wrestler. Do you remember Carlito? It's a, it's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Carl, he, he used to bite the apple. We were yeah. talking about this. I, I do another podcast and we were talking about this because I couldn't remember if it was tomatoes or apples. It was apples. He, um, he used to bite something and spit them. But he was long gone a while back, right? He, Yeah, so he is still gone, but he came back as a surprise in the Royal Rumble this year. And he Did, did he spit an apple? He didn't. So maybe because of COVID, but like, you know, you talk about COVID restrictions, they're still going, still getting in there and being all sweaty and wrestling with each other. So yeah, that's pretty know, hardcore. There isn't really much of a bubble in terms of like, you know, I don't know, wrestling. It's a wild thing. I've got, uh, 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 oh no, I don't want to I'll tell you that story another time. <laughs> okay. A treat, um, Matthew. But speaking of COVID, I met Carlito incidentally. Oh, did you? When I went to WrestleMania, yeah. Was he nice? Ah, uh, he seemed very cross. Uh, the thing with the wrestlers, I met a few of them, uh, and I couldn't tell if they were like genuinely cross and grumpy, or like that was their shtick. Well, because do I don't know. I don't know how like like full time their personas are you know I, I don't know if it's like whenever they're facing the public like even journalists that they still do their their whole thing there was one guy who i thought was really nice he was quite old he was like um i want to say he was like like he was slightly older mexican guy slightly older mexican guy chavo guerrero senior he was like an he was like a kindly uncle 
Um, yeah, that that surname rings a bell. Actually, that sounds right. It might be. What year was this? Two thousand and seven. Was he there in two thousand and seven? He might have been. Uh, yeah, Chavo Guerrero, Senior. He was he was referred to as Chavo Classic in the WWE. Might be him. Like he would have I've been an older it. man. Oh, uh, maybe I don't know. But there was one I thought, oh, he seemed all right. He seemed all right. He was very down to earth. And he was the only one who didn't roll their eyes when I asked him a question about Wii Sports. There was, a, there was a two wrestlers who are a married couple. There's a lot of wrestlers that are married couples. Uh, like Triple H is married to Vince McMahon's daughter in real life. Right. Yeah, this guy. I mean, there was one guy. He was like a bit, he was like, you're absolutely like a big, muscly, like neck that was just like diagonal down to his shoulders type. He was a real like, <laughs> who, had, who was there with his wrestling wife. Was he threatening? Did you find, was he, was he all right? He was very, he was like a bit, you know, you forget that these people are real. Like when you see some of their bodies in on TV or in video Mm. games, you're like, yeah. And then we see in real life, you think, oh shit, that really is what they look like. Mm. But anyway. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. This Uh, isn't a, uh, uh, Matthew poorly remembers wrestling. I'm I'm enjoying this segment though, this regular segment. Uh, But Matthew, speaking of COVID and spreading germs and all that, uh, can you open your mouth for me? Get that (laughs) prank. Uh, and open that news gob because I have some information snacks to spit in your mouth. Nom, 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 Info nom, snacks nom, 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 for his gob. <sighs> so, in the last... A horrible intro. In the last week, speaking of COVID and spreading germs, um, people were modding Cyberpunk 2077 to have sex with Keanu Reeves last week, something the CD Projekt Red promptly shut down, probably after hearing from Keanu Reeves' legal team. Uh, they said... <laughs> CD Projekt Red said that they were okay with people swapping out characters for you to have sex with, but not a real-life person. So don't be doing that, all right? You pucks. Mm. Uh, Also, a year after launch, Ninja Theory have said that they're not going to be updating Bleeding Edge anymore as they shift focus onto Hellblade 2. The reason I included this specifically was because, Jesus Christ, do you remember Bleeding Edge? Because it had totally left my mind. Do you, do you, can it you felt re- like a bit. Yeah, I, I do remember it because it was the weird one that they were working on just as Microsoft bought them. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then at the time, people thought, are they just banging out a sports game because Microsoft want like a Rocket League type thing? Um, yeah. That fe- it's kind of that feels like already it feels like a different age, doesn't it? The kind of um, it does. Yeah. Like, a lot of people trying to do their own kind of Overwatch kind of hero game. I mean, even, like, what's Ubisoft's one called again? Uh, Didn't they have that skating one? Roller Champions, that's not out yet. Yeah. Is, no, that's e- is that EA? Roller Champions? Who's Roller Champions? Is that Ubisoft? No, EA's one was Rocket Arena. Oh, you're right. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. But yeah, it, it, yeah just people just lashing out these uh, kind of multiplayer yeah. games, trying to get people on board and... Yeah. I mean, like, I think with them, it doesn't really matter what else they do as long as they make Hellblade 2 because loads of people really like Hellblade 1. So, you know, why not experiment if you've got, like, if you've got a winner? Yep. Try something else. Uh, Capcom, Matthew, are making money Mm -hmm. hand over fist. In the company's latest earnings report, it was showing that Capcom's net sales are up 22.6% and operating income is up 32.2% year on year. And Capcom themselves have put this down to Resident Evil 3 sales and, and this I found mental, Monster Hunter World continuing to sell gangbusters. Like, that, isn't that game, I think it's the best selling game Capcom have ever had, I'm pretty sure, Monster Hunter World. It's it, was, so, it's been, it's, it's, it was weird because it had that huge second wind on PC. Because of the Iceborne, Iceborne was it? Well, no, no, just because it came out later on PC, oh, yeah. and, and you know, it was yeah, people were just really up for it. Um, I, I, maybe I, they they finally like hit that magic balancing act of it's like weird and monster huntery, mm. but it has enough kind of concessions to like friendlier action conventions of Western games, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, it's good. Yeah, good for them. Also, I imagine they'll do mega business off the Switch ones because they've got the first big Switch Monster Hunter coming out soon, haven't well, they? Your race, your race. Yeah, yeah. Is it Rise or something? Uh, I, I think it is. I think it is. Uh, EA have announced the formation of Full Circle, which is a new studio that they have set up specifically to make Skate Four. Uh, the studio is being headed up by former Xbox Live GM Daniel McCulloch who worked in Microsoft for 15 years before leaving last June. Um, I mean, that's the only little morsel we have on Skate 4 yet. We still haven't seen it in action. It's probably a ways they waited, away. But do you think they... I mean, I'm sure they didn't... They were working on this already. They didn't wait for, like, the, the success or the, or the buzz around Tony, Tony Hawk. Hawk. Mm, maybe. I guess it's a very different game, isn't it? It's not... I mean, I mean, it's, it's, would you say it's, I mean, it's still about skateboarding. Like, yes, it is, it is, yeah, but it's, a, not, it is but it's, it's not like, you know, the mad arcade yeah. impossibility of Tony Hawk, you know, skate is a lot more like what you can actually do on a skateboard, which is no way near as impressive as what you can do in, <laughs> in a Tony Hawk game. Like Tony Hawk is fantasy skateboarding and it's amazing it's in real life. The thing is, I, this may sound terrible. Every once in a while, I'll see a tweet of um, like a clip of Tony Hawk doing one of those spins, mm-hmm. and they're no way near as impressive to watch real life. I fight, you know, like a man spinning twice round. Mm-hmm. You think, uh, yeah, I mean, I get, I, like, I know it's impossible. Like, I can't even make a skateboard go forward on flat ground without falling off. But in the game, it feels like, whoa, I'm spinning around and around and around. Where in real life, it's it really looks like panicked, like shit. I've got to spin before I fall off. <laughs> it's not like slow motion and cool. It's it's actually very hurried and like it's quite a small motion, isn't it? A man doing a, a, a man turning or twice. A seven seven twenty doesn't. It isn't like someone's slow motion going round and around. It's a very quick like shit. I've got to make use of one second of airtime. I mean, but, like, well, yeah. When you break it down, you just say a man spinning around twice. <laughs> it, yeah. I don't listen. I, I like. I realise it's a very fine art and a huge skill, and he's hugely talented. But I'm just saying, it's more I like impressive the video game, in the game version more. Yep. And skate is a bit more like what it is in real life. You're like so boring. You know, whoa, you jumped up a step. Uh, do you remember that Lord of the Rings Gollum game Matthew because it was originally meant to be out this year but it's now been delayed to 2022 Uh, I I don't do people still like I mean I know the answer to this but like do people still like Lord of the Rings like they do they're they're still good I feel like there's not like masses of momentum behind Lord of the Rings For, for, for a series that big it's been a little uneven as a, you know, pop, pop culture th- outside of those original films. It's been a bit stop start. I was going to say, I think that some of that is down to The Hobbit. Like, I think The Hobbit made people yeah. go, oh. I mean, there's maybe they're waiting for the Amazon TV show, which I may did not tri- know what. The- they're doing a Lord of the Rings Amazon TV show. They're doing a big. They're basically doing Lord of the Rings meets Game of Thrones. Um, it's like a. I think it's a prequel. I think it's a base. I think it's like, you know, s- like Sauron, like around the sort of original Sauron rise to power, oh. forging of the Ring period. But like, yeah, just a big drama set in Lord of the Rings. Um, so maybe that. I mean, that'll be pre Gollum, but. You know, still Lord of the Rings. Might, people yeah. might be in, might be in the mood for some Gollum. Yeah, <laughs> while they're watching that. Um, are you in the mood for some Kung Fu Cats, Matthew? Because we finally have a release date for Boy Mutants. Thank Christ! Every year it pops up on most anticipated games of the year, and that can stop now, which is good, as it's out on the twenty fifth of May. Very much looking forward to this. Everything I, we've seen, no, I think, I, looks great. I, like, yeah, like. I remember seeing this at Gamescom in 2017 and thinking, wow, that looks amazing. And they've just been chipping this. away at it. It's a very, it's quite a small team. I think there's only like 20 of them or something for like a big open world game. I mean, no wonder it's taken them ages. I, like, this could be absolutely amazing. Like, everything they've shown, the demos have always been really impressive. And I love the way they talk about it when you did that interview with them last mm-hmm. year. Um, you know the guys are super interesting. They're, all, I think they're like ex Avalanche, like some of the yep. ex sort of Just Cause team. Yep. Um, yeah, I hope this is great. I love a good surprise 
Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Uh, Microsoft aren't one for giving out numbers, but last week they announced that Xbox Game Pass has a total of 18 million subscribers, which is an 8 million increase in nine months. Are you one of the people holding out? Because if you are, you're very silly. Get on Xbox Game Pass, because later on I'm going to talk about what is essentially Xbox Game Pass, the video game. Um, so yeah, be one of those people. It's great value. And... Finally, the final information snack for you, Matthew, is that as good as the GameStop story is, right, I'm going to implore our viewers, our listeners to watch Bloomberg or uh, what's the other one, MSNBC or whatever instead, because I don't think we'll add much when it comes to explaining how shorting works or any like listen i even went back and i watched the big short at the weekend because i was like oh there's talk of the stock market and stuff you know <laughs> my knowledge of the stock market probably comes from probably two things really which is billions and um and the big short so i was like i'll watch the big short again and see if i can wrap my head around this any further and some of it yes but some of it is like i don't know but my god christian bale do you know what? Watching The Big Short, it, it got me thinking, is Christian Bale actually underrated as an actor? Or is that ludicrous talk? I think he's quite hard to, like, unpick from what you think about Christian Bale as, you know, he's quite a... Uh, what's the right word? A demanding? Or a, or a... I figure, yeah, I guess. I mean, there's something odd about, you know... Like, he's not very good at the celebrity. He's not like a celebrity, he's not a cele- is he? He's yes. Not- but even because I, like I, I then... He's very, very... He's quite a serious... He seems like quite he's, a serious chap. He's quite, he's quite hard to get a read on. Uh, he is quite serious. But like he, the way he... Even the way he throws himself into, you know, like the machinist to Batman, to American Psycho, to uh, the one where he was Dick Cheney, to the fighter. Like, how much he throws himself into his roles. Like... I'm not saying he is Daniel Day-Lewis. All right, so calm down. But I'm saying, like, his commitment is that level. Like, he is very much your sort of your method. I need to immerse myself in this person. And, you know. Yeah, I, I, I like him. I'm a, big, I'm a big Christian Bale fan, but he is, you know, I don't know, ever since that tape of him losing his Batman. freaking mind, which was like 20 years ago now, it feels like. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, uh, he, he will be forever remembered for that, but still. Oh, it's Chris, just a shame because he's. He, like, get, he he's gets the weak spot seal of approval. He gets the weak spot yeah. seal of approval, Christian Bale. Um, I, watched the, I watched The Prestige last night. Oh. <laughs> Christian good. Bale, good in that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's great in that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen it before, obviously. I just, I'm, I'm not, you know. Just, just, you know, just adding to the Christian Bale love. He's very good. Yeah. So yes, headlines and hot takes is the parent of the PC Gaming Week spot where we discuss the big news of the past week. Obviously enough, as I made reference to, probably the biggest news of the week was the GameStop stuff, even though GameStop could have been any company. It, it just it just so happened to be a video game related story, sort of. But, you know, again, watch people who know what they're talking about, whereas we can pretend to know what we're talking about when it comes to the actual video games, like Hitman 3, Matthew, uh, a game that we have discussed quite a lot on here and yes. have sang its praises apart from the last level. Uh, but IO Interactive... Uh, I, did a, I did a ranking you on did, the you did? RPS well, of uh, all 21 levels from the three games. And I ranked Carpathian Mountains at number 21. Good man. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, But yeah, we actually have a question in Burning Questions about that. So we'll talk about that uh, a bit later. But IO Interactive have been doing the the interview rounds over the past week and spoke about two things, one Hitman and James Bond. We'll talk about James Bond in a second. But when speaking to GamesIndustry.biz, I always said, we have recouped the total project costs in less than a week. That puts us in a really good place and allows us to confidently move forward with our ambitious plans for future projects. And also related to Hitman 3, speaking with The Gamer, executive producer Forrest Swartout-Large, which is an incredible 
terrible name, first of all. Uh, Forrest said, we are definitely going to be doing some DLC, but we haven't defined what that is. I think for now, we are looking at new maps like the bank and the island. We're more looking at using existing locations and reimagining them, twisting them. So what do you want, Matthew, from Hitman DLC? Because I suppose Hitman 2, there was no, there were no extra levels for the, the original Hitman, were there? For Hitman 2, there was four. Yeah, so Hitman 1 had weird DLC in that it had a kind of extra story campaign called Patient Zero. Oh, yes. Subject Zero. That's Patient Zero, Patient wasn't it? Zero, yeah. which kind of took uh, four of the levels and so not reskin them, but it did sort of change what was happening in them. You know, they had different routines and like in Bangkok, there was this weird cult on the top floor of the hotel where not much happens in the original level. So they did that. Then they also did two sort of um, sort of substantial new missions in Sapienza. There was the one with the sort of film set, mm-hmm. and the other one was in Marrakesh. Um, so like they've gone in and done, you know, used existing spaces for exciting new things. Um, so ju- judging from what they're saying here, you would expect. Something similar if they're not talking Something about Something along those a- lines. I mean, I did think when playing this that there were a few levels where it felt like there was more to be done in that space, particularly um, Chongqing has like a lot of, not like wasted space as such, but it's a big level for what actually happens there. And I thought, oh yeah, it could definitely do, do more here. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of... Yeah, I'm interested to see that. I mean, I'd love it if they made more levels, but I get I, that. That's, I was just going to say, is it a bit disappointing that they're not talking about making a Haven Islands and a New York and a whatever yeah, else? Yeah, just because I mean, they were also really, really strong levels. Like, I, I actually think when they've done the DLC, and the, the, the previous DLC, it did tie into the main story, but when they're not worrying about any of that, like how it fits into this mm. Hitman 3 kind of arc, just having... You know, you can just focus it on it as a really self-contained space, just a really self-contained fun place. Like both ha- uh, Haven Island and New York were really good. You know, they're really super strong levels, I think. Mm-hmm. So it's a shame we won't get that. But then I also get it. Like this game kind of draws a line under the whole story and, you know, basically, you know, sort of, well, I won't spoil the ending of it, but, you know, it would be odd to then go, Oh, and by the way, he did two more missions. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, but the, the way they're talking in these interviews, uh, like they mentioned something, even if I bring it back I love up this. There. I love this footage, by the way. Uh, I forgot to mention this last time. Like there's a, one of the targets was walking along with his two bodyguards and you ran up and literally machine gunned him to death and then ran away. <laughs> you were the least subtle assassin I'd ever seen. <laughs> sometimes sometimes that's the, the perfect way to go about playing Hitman. Um, but like when they're, t- uh, when they're talking about DLC and, you know, kind of moving forward and whatever else. Um, yeah, there's not much of a mention really about a Hitman 4, as it were. Um, but, uh, and I suppose it is difficult to see how, you know, how, how you would get more Agent 47 without just going, uh, we're rebooting it again, <laughs> sure. Or there's like an... Yeah, I, which, they, which they could do. I mean, the fact that this has done so well for them, um, Hitman 3, suggests that maybe, like, actually, if, if you have kind of finally broken through in a way that you hadn't with Hitman 1 and 2, you might want to ride that momentum. Yeah. I mean... Yeah. I was looking. Um, I was looking at their <clears throat> jobs page a, a while back, um, mainly on the off chance that it might be looking for like to hire a big James Bond nerd as a junior writer or something. <laughs> uh, they're not sadly, but in in a lot of their you know the the roles they're recruiting for, they're like come and join the you know the 007 team, or they've still got lots of jobs for the Hitman team. Right. You know, it seems like a Hitman team is an ongoing concern. It's not like everything i you know i don't get the impression everything's going to switch to bond yeah yeah um we'll see it would be a shame especially seeing as you know when they're talking about selling gangbusters uh for hitman 3 to just put them out to pasture but you know we'll see i suppose they are focusing on james bond at the minute 
And in the couple of interviews that they were doing, they did obviously chat about Project 007. Uh, I.O. director Hakan Abrak said, when speaking to The Gamer, he said that the company is planning to expand to around 400 people, with their about 200 now, uh, to kind of continue developing James Bond. He said, quote, it's a very, very special, a boy's dream. Sometimes it's still a little hard to understand that it's us making James Bond. Today we have 200 employees. I expect that we will have uh, over 400 employees over the next four years. So there is no doubt that the Bond agreement means an insane amount to us. And then in an mm. other interview with uh, a Danish publication called Dior, uh, Abrak said, we... Uh, where is it? Here. Uh, he said, quote, we have been allowed to make our own digital bond, which will not lean on a bond actor. We also came up with a completely original story and you could easily imagine that a trilogy could come out of it, which was obviously the big thing that people yeah. took from this. A James Bond trilogy. Uh, I mean, how excited are you, Matthew? Get a I James, mean, yeah, Bond, get a James it, Bond trilogy. You know, I mean, we shouldn't get too excited until we've played part one. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, I mean, the I you know, yeah, in my head that obviously fires up images of or once if they do it like Hitman and it's just like a big collection of Bond stories that get updated. You know, I, as anyone I, who's listened, to, as anyone who's listened to the weak spot will know. Like, I basically just want them to carry on making Hitman, Hitman. games, but with James Bond. Um, <laughs> so, I, like, <laughs> that's my my ideal model for most games going forward is what they did with the Hitman trilogy. <laughs> like, I, I do, I suppose, yeah, I still wonder what form the James Bond game takes because it's probably not just going to be, you know, Hitman, but like, instead of, say, the Dark Moor level, you would just get more Mendozas. Uh, but, I don't know, we'll see. A trilogy is interesting. They're obviously... I just want the whole game to be Bond moving between different vineyards. <laughs> I just want it to be 10 Mendozas in a row. That sounds pretty exciting. My Getting time. increasingly drunk at each one. Ooh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd definitely sign up for that. I think that sounds exciting. Uh, in other news, Matthew, uh, Warner Brothers, um, a company oh, which yeah. you may be aware of. They also make films. Oh, I'm, I'm familiar with their yeah, work. Maybe they've made some films that Christian Bale was in. He, I'm, I'm sure he was a very good actor. Uh, so Warner Brothers have hinted in the past, uh, well, it was spotted in the past week, that they are focusing on games as service games. Hooray. Uh, this was spotted by a Twitter user called Mauro NL, who spotted this job listing for a games production MBA intern. The job listing said, WBIE is currently involved in a variety of new projects, ranging from casual games to core games, featuring our well-known franchises on all platforms with a heavy focus on live service. Now, this same Mauro uh, did some nice little, well, I mean, they did the legwork for us. They said that the games WB is currently working on that we know about are Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga, Back for Blood, Gotham Knights, Hogwarts Legacy, and Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. And mm. some other studios that don't have any uh, announced games at the minute are NetherRealm, who are the Mortal Kombat studio, Monolith, who are the Shadow of War people. Um, and that's kind of when it comes to PC games, that's what would be relevant to us. Um mm. I mean, I think I've asked you before when talking about even specifically Gotham Knights uh, and like whether this would take the form of like a superhero destiny or whatever. Are you still confident that this will be more, I don't know, a Borderlands or whatever, where it's just, you know, a co-op adventure and there's RPG elements, but it's not going to be have a, a live service element? I just think it, it looks so much like what uh, they've done with Assassin's Creed in the RPG space, right. which is a service game. I mean, the thing now, I think, is that like a lot of games are. like, <laughs> It's not got to the point where more games are service games than not, but it's just, it's like a back-of-the-box feature. I think it doesn't necessarily mean everything's going to be Destiny. It just means, you know, games that have... Uh, I guess it's replaced like traditional, you get a game, then you get DLC. You now get a game and you get like a drip feed of features which kind of continue a relationship with that game and it becomes a live service game. 
I mean, a lot of the games on this list already have that. I mean, Back for Blood, an online co-op shooter. Of course, it's going to be a service game. Like new things being updated, new levels, new characters, whatever. Like that makes perfect sense. Um, any fighting game is a service game these days. Mortal Kombat, you know, is already a service game with new features, new modes you know, updated challenges, you know, it doesn't take much to become one. I mean, I suppose I mean, it, the, it depends on your definition of service game, but to me, like, that would be, like, a service game is a destiny, is a, is a, a I, division. I, see, I don't think, I think it was. I think that's, like, the hardcore version, and I'm sure that they're going to do that. Like, I've, I've got a, I just, I got a, a feeling in my bones, Suicide Squad is going to be big, big, big Destiny vibes. I mean, like, which is odd, because, Gotham Knights, or you know, has that kind of RPG element to it. But I think I think Gotham Knights is still going to be a, uh, you know, it's got this co-op focus, but it's only co-op. It, it, it looks a lot more like, um, like I say, like in Assassin's Creed. Like I imagine it'll be quite a self-contained story mode. But I think Suicide Squad, like from that little teaser they've shown, has been quite explicitly about playing with other people. I think that's going to be much closer to like a Marvel's Avengers. Um, which I think Gotham Knights is going to be lean much closer to um, what was going on in okay. like the other Arkham games, for example. Um, yeah. But I, I don't think it has to mean the full destiny. I think I think it's these days, you know, you know Gears of War is a service game. You know, it adds new, you know, there's, there's new guff, new reasons to play the campaign, new daily, weekly, monthly challenges or whatever. Nice. I don't think it takes much. I don't think it takes much to push you into the service game space. I don't think you have to be explicitly an always online multiplayer game. You know, yeah. Hitman is a service game, you know, it's. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that and, 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 and yeah, I just think, but I think that's just what defines games at the moment. I just think that that is the current model, and it isn't that everything is destiny. It's that you buy a game, and you know they just continue to feed you stuff. They keep trying to get you to play. They want it to feel exciting and relevant all the time. They want people talking about the game all the time, not just in the week that it comes out. I think that's what it means to be a service game. It doesn't necessarily mean you commit to playing something for a thousand hours. It just means that it'll feel relevant for two years as opposed to one week. Although, that, is, it, that is my read on the situation. Okay. Yeah, I mean, which look, we'll we'll see what comes of all this. However, you have got me. Just, you have you have got me yeah. excited for a Destiny Hitman. That would be quite good. <laughs> Four no, little bald stuff, people I, running I around. I think it's like like there are certain terms that people automatically kind of rail against. Because they've got like bad, you know, and, and the people are desperately trying to avoid those terms. So, like this generation, I think saw the kind of the loot crate become like yeah. a toxic concept, and any hint of it, regardless of how it's used or what it actually means for the game, equals death. Even if it's actually harmless or pointless or whatever. Um, and I think Warner Brothers probably learned that from what happened with the the second Mordor game, mm -hmm. which was obviously like lent very heavily into that and got massively burned where I don't feel like the games as service thing is like toxic in the same way, but it's actually, an, you know, anything where you can sell a battle pass or expansions every couple of months or whatever. I mean, it's just a different way of making money. It feels less offensive than loot crates. That, that is the, that, that is the new loot crate, I think. Um, yeah. And, yeah people don't seem to reject that. So I don't know, maybe that's bollocks. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> um, but I mean, the, yeah, but like go back a couple of years and it was single player DLC, I suppose was the way that you, yeah, kept that's the thing, you know, and, and on board. yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting actually, like, you know, people are like, Oh, we don't want service game, blah, 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 blah. But then like you get cyberpunk and that is a game that now feel to me feels completely done. You know, like I feel like I've done everything in that world where actually it could have had a tail on it. You know, that is a very traditional, mm -hmm. you know, that is just going to do chunks of DLC. And right now it feels dead in a way that a lot of other games don't. I, mean, I always used to find that weird with DLC, like in the 360 generation, I'd play a game and then maybe like a year later be expected to dust off that game to play like an hour more of it. 
And I always just think that's a bit odd. That's a bit. That's a bit strange. And um, I'm actually up for like you know, hey, is a reason to yeah, like a reason every few weeks to maybe be interested. I don't. I don't think that's terrible. Yeah. It's quite a strong lineup Warner Brothers has actually. It is. It is indeed. Quite I mean, a lot of big, you know, a lot of big stuff, and you know, a couple of silent studios who are probably working on stuff to come after that. Uh, I mean, uh, looking at Nether Realm, I mean, they were going Mortal Kombat Injustice, Mortal Kombat Injustice, and it would imply that we would be looking at an Injustice three coming up soon. But I, I really enjoyed Injustice, actually. Uh, but that's for another time, Matthew, because what's that ahead of us? It's a feckin' right angle. It's Tech Corner. And Matthew, quite simply, this is staggering. eBay scalpers have apparently made a profit of $15.2 million on graphics cards. So my question to you, Matthew, is what's the biggest profit you've made on a second-hand item? Oh. I once, actually, and this ties back, I don't know if this counts, but, but it sort of connects to the GameSpot, uh, GameStop stuff. I once bought a share, I once bought some shit stocks in a diamond mine. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, just to see what would happen. And, did and you, it drove me insane. Did it make you loads of money? Did yeah, you... no, it didn't make me lots of money, but I beca- you become obsessed with it because you're constantly worried that, like, in a day, the story can change. And it's te- it was terrible. I just couldn't stop looking at checking up on it. And I was like, this isn't for me. I haven't got the nurse for this. Had, had you... Actually, it wasn't, a di- it wasn't a dynamite. It was a, basically a company had bought a place where they thought there was going to be, there, was go- there could be a lot of gold. Right. Okay. Well, and I was I, like, oh, okay. Yeah, and, and there was suddenly a flurry of interest. And, you know, I made like a couple of hundred pounds. Woo! Yeah. Well done. That's pretty impressive. Had you recently watched Trading Places or something? Like what? No, Me- no. I had a, 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 a friend who sort of... Who knew said, about... Oh, this... Right. Yeah, knew this stuff and said, oh, this seems interesting. Um, but it, not like insider trading or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, oh, well, like, I mean, if you inside a trade for like a fucking hundred quid, not that I did, Ma- but like, Matthew did... Axelrod here, fucking. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> that's the thing. I mean, that's that's the thing about billions. If I was Bobby Axelrod, mm. I'd be on my phone like every twenty seconds, going, "Oh God, I'm not, oh, I'm not, I'm not rich yet, I'm not poor yet." But he, he just got to have the confidence it's going to happen, which I I didn't have. Um, you know, Still, if I was but, anyone, I, I, rather than Bobby Axelrod, I'm a lot more like Steve Carell in The Big Short. Right, okay. okay. Kind of vaguely, quite highly strung. <laughs> but not £10 billion pounds richer. So no. Okay. So I don't know pounds. if that counts as a second-hand thing, but there you go. It'll do, it'll do. It's a much, what more, about you? much more impressive answer than, uh, than I could give or I was expecting. I don't think I've ever made a profit off anything second-hand, to be honest. I've never bought, like, foolishly, like when the PlayStation 5 was coming out, I probably should have bought seven of them if I could or anything like that. Like, I've never... Uh, and, like, any time I've pushed bets down... Uh, I mean, speaking of wrestling, I, I actually put a fiver bet on Edge winning the Royal Rumble and he won. Yeah, surely so, you can't bet on wrestling. You can bet on wrestling, yeah. But it's scripted. How can you possibly... Whoa, 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 whoa. It's what? Matthew. But you, how can you possibly bet on a script? How can you bet on a scripted event? How do it's, they stop? It's incredibly foolish. Thankfully, I had a free bet on Edge, so I put that out a five or three bet and it well, won. Well, that's, I literally, cause surely if you're a WWE writer, you just go, oh, I'll bet a million pounds on this. I mean, it, you, uh, I mean, I, uh, I'm just amazed that you'd accept that bet. You, you would probably, I've never heard of it in wrestling now, but like in football, you get that, where like football players will bet on things and pe- players have been embroiled in scandal because they've bet on they, matches that they were involved in and stuff. But surely a single player can only affect a match that much in a cell as fucking goalkeeper. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like in wrestling, like you know it's not like there's no chance, there's no luck in any of it. Like it's one hundred percent the outcome is decided. Is um, it not? Um 
I, 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 yeah, yeah, it is. All right. Okay, fine. We'll ruin the dream for everyone watching. Jesus Christ. But yeah, it's a very foolish thing and you should never bet on professional wrestling. However, I made 15 quid off it at the Royal Rumble. I, so that's oh all right. My God. Show and tell, show and tell. We can't afford a proper jingle. Jingle. It's meant to be jingle. Yes, yeah, show and tell is the part of the piece of gaming week spot where we discuss the video games we've been playing over the last seven days. And Matthew, I made reference to this earlier. The game I have played is Xbox Game Pass, the video game. This is the... Uh. It, it is the perfect game that, like, I think it's about 40 quid. Should you pay 40 quid? Should you fuck? Nobody should ever pay 40 pounds for this video game. However, if you have a 10 pounds a month subscription to Game Pass, ideal, ideal, because it has bad points, it has good points. Uh, the game I'm talking about, of course, is the medium. Um, so, yeah, I, I uh, when reviews started dropping for this last week, I was actually quite excited to play it because I feel like it's a rarity where you get a video game that splits uh, the critical opinion like that much. It does happen. There was an Assassin's Creed that did it. I remember Ukulele did it. Like there's, there's a few that will, you, you'll have like varying eights and nines and then threes and fours or whatever. And that's <clears> what the medium was. And I, like those games I find are often at least trying to do something. Uh, mm. some people will enjoy it, some people won't, but at least it's not cookie cutter sort of run of the mill. Um, mm. However, the medium, <laughs> I disagree with everyone on this. It is a totally middling game. It is like, it's not great. I don't understand people saying it's a game of the year. However, I also don't understand people saying that this should be burnt to death if you can do that with the game and we should never speak of it again. You know, like it should be ET'd essentially. No, it's not. It's yeah. It's a totally middling game. Um, so for those that don't know, you play as a medium, a, a spirit medium. So you're able to communicate with ghosts. Uh, and however, there's actually, there's one part of it that really annoys me about this, right? <laughs> there's a lot of parts that really annoy me. But one, when I'm talking about conversations with ghosts, uh, you talk to yourself absolutely loads in this game, which is really annoying. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's really annoying because Bloober Team, the developer, even had an out. They didn't have to go on Nathan Drake with this because the story is framed through uh, uh, your main character, Marianne, the medium, is actually retelling the story, the events of the game to somebody. So they didn't have right. to go the route of Marion picking up something and going, huh, a bolt cutters. I could cut things with this. It's like, no, you don't need it. You don't need it. Anyway, um, you are called to this hotel where there, again, there's been a massacre at this hotel. Why you go to the hotel, who knows? Anyway, you do because you've got a mysterious phone call from someone who has told you that they know that you're able to communicate with ghosts and they're able to explain to you why you can do this. Uh, it's quite mm. a cook. It's a very cookie cutter horror story with cheesy dialogue, cheesy delivery. It's mainly all right. Um, you'll guess one of the bigger twists very early on because it's they telegraph it a, a lot. Um, but I did find there's enough to drive you through its story, and it's it's short as well. Like it's I don't know six or seven hours. It's maybe even probably yeah. an hour too long to be honest. Uh, but I still think there is like, there's enough to keep you going when it comes to the actual story. There is one mm. character and one aspect of the story that they wildly miss the mark on. Um, it is quite a heavy topic and they, f they fuck it massively. Um, like, I, I, I think, you know, yes. video, video, <laughs> ga video games as a medium, ha ha, uh, it, it, like it should be able to tackle heavy topics, right? Yeah. Um, 100%. But, I, and like people, you know, people forget, I suppose, like film and literature and everything, like, they've been around for a long time or even just take film. Film has been around for quite a while. Games, not quite as long. So video games will sometimes try to tackle subjects and they will fail. You know, that's fine. Mm. It's learning, blah, blah, blah. However, the, uh, how much they missed the mark on this is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, 
so yeah, so that's kind of like this. But as on the whole, mm. the story is all right. It's okay. There's a, a hilarious thing at the start of this game where it has like a trigger warning, but it doesn't tell you what it's trigger warning for because it doesn't want to spoil its own story. So it's just like, watch out. There's something for bad everything. in this you might not like. And you're like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> A trigger warning just for everything. Like you got to tell it. You're like, everything. watch out. If you are, if you are prone to being triggered by the Lynch. concept of stuff, <laughs> if you are upset by things, this is not the game play for this you. game. Yes. It has things that are upsetting in it, and you're like, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, well, one of the things this game has is puzzles. It has quite a lot of puzzles, and they often revolve around you. Freeing spirits, right? Because as I said, there was like a massacre at this hotel you go to and there's a lot of trapped spirits here. And quite, uh, I suppose, yeah, the the puzzles are asking you to to free the spirits and these involve you walking into a room, picking up an item, listening to the memories that these items generate, yes, and then eventually you'll learn enough about each person to send them on their merry way, right? Like yeah. everything in this game, it's mostly fine. You walk into a room, yeah. you pick up a teddy, you look at it, you go, oh yeah, this is a person who's been through a harrowing incident. Then you walk into the next room, you pick up a photograph, you do the same thing. It is mm. it, it is very Silent Hill slash Resident Evil, like old school Resident Evil, minus the combat. But even down to the fixed camera, which... I, I, some people are going to be put off by the fixed camera. I, I do, do you know what it reminds me of actually. So I've, I've I've only played the first maybe hour and a half, maybe two hours of this. Um, I thought it really reminded me of Quantic Dream games. Okay, like heavy rain, um, like how it control like static angles, steering quite a quite a cl- kind of clumsy mm-hmm. character. It's not nice to move around in the world. No. Um, but it, and it felt more like an adventure game because I was collecting lots of items and I got to one like absolutely shit stealth section. Um, but outside of that, it could have been a just a purely like, you know, a very expensive looking kind of point and click game. It, like that, that's what it is. Like that's the, those are the puzzles. It's just yeah, p- picking mm. up items and what like as you say, it's a it's an adventure game. It's very similar to the Quantic Dream. Um, Quantic Dream sort of formula as well. Uh, you mentioned the the stealth, right? So when you're going around doing these puzzles, I should say, right, if you don't know, and I'm talking about ghosts and all that, like this was marketed as a horror game. And yeah. the stealth section, Matthew, you're referring to involves a big monster called the Maw. Uh, and it is, I mean... It, Mr. X, the Maw is not. So the Maw is this weird, it's like, do you remember in Metal Gear Solid when you put on the bandana and you'd have stealth, but it's like that shimmering kind of outline of a character. That's what the Maw is. That's what you see the Maw as often. Uh, uh, uh. And it's, this monster is sort of unintentionally funny a lot of the time because it says things like, I want to wear your skin. And I don't know. Ooh, I'm a bad little monster boy. Other things like that. And these these sections, they just involve you... Yeah, you're, like you're just... You're, you're clunkily moving around, sne- trying to sneak around this monster. And they're a piece of piss. Like, there is no threat from the monster. There is no threat that you're going to fail this thing. It's It's very simple. It's, I suppose, if we're talking about Resident Evil... I could maybe liken it to Miss, um, not Mr. X, uh, what's his name? Nemesis from Resident Evil 3. Not in how imposing the monster is or anything like that, but in that, uh, from the remake I'm talking about now, because the monster sequences, uh, uh, like you know when they're happening and when, you, when, you're out, when you're out of there, you don't have to worry about that monster. It's not coming back. Yeah. And you can walk around freely because there isn't combat. Like, it's all about hiding from the monster, uh, running away from any threat, no combat whatsoever. And holding a button as you walk through a load of moths. Yeah, holding a button when you walk through moths to bring a little go, um, globe around yourself. But it's, it, like, that is one of the medium's biggest problems, is, is how incredibly unscary it is. 
There is one yeah. jump scare. There's one jump scare, to be fair, near the beginning of the game that I thought worked quite well. Do you remember? I won't spoil it, but you're looking through a little peephole. Yeah, but it's yeah. Like I, I thought, I thought that that made me jump. I was it's like, like jump scare one hundred one. Oh, hundred percent jump scare one hundred one. But I was like, I, I think that's that's it. And you see the thing, like this is they've called this a. I think it's a psychological horror game, is what they've called this. And I'm like. That's a, that's Whenever a, that's someone a says psychological horror game, that means it's not actually scary. <laughs> it means it's a it's a it's a chin stroker, you know. But like, like their other games, I really don't rate Blue Poutine. Uh I think layers. Of, I think the original layers of fear. I think that's, the ori- that's the that's the that's the only like that's that is creepy. Layers of fear too. I cannot remember a more in a horror game. Layers of fear. Oh, actually, yeah. I can. It's the medium. <laughs> Um, but it, it, it's it's a drama with supernatural elements. That's what the medium yeah. is. It's not. But but like, what did you make the split thing? So that's what I was going to get onto. The one, like the medium's hook, is its split reality, which I quite like. Like that's why you play the medium. Um, that's that's what you come here for. So like Marianne, as I said, this medium, she's able to talk to ghosts, blah blah blah. But at times. Uh, she will see a split in reality where she can see the real world and the world of the dead. And sometimes you go between both as well. But the split is the, that's the kind of the hook. There'll either be a horizontal line or a vertical line in the middle of the screen, splitting the two worlds. And I, yeah, I quite, I thought it worked quite well. Because like, for example, the, uh, I think this happens quite early on. It is actually, it's one of the first things. So when you come into the hotel and it's the, when you get the split, you see that in the real world, there's a, uh, cause you need to go upstairs, right? In this hotel. And in the real world, the stairs are, they've all crumbled. You can't use them essentially. But in the um, fictional world, I was going to say, the world of the div- uh, uh, dead, the spirit world, the staircase is there. But like to make movements, to navigate this hotel, you need to make sure that they're, are clear passageways in both, essentially. Like uh, the one world will affect the other and what you do in one world will also affect uh, affect the other. And I mm. thought, yeah, I thought it worked quite well. Now, there were some technical hitches. Like it's it's not the smoothest running game on PC. Um, But like, I thought when it worked, it worked quite well. And like this idea, I think would be better served in a a better game, I suppose you know something with a better story. I don't know more excitement. It is it can be quite laborious at times. But yeah, I, I quite enjoyed mm. the split. I don't know why. What, what did you What did you think of it? Yeah, I like the puzzles that I did with it were weren't weren't very interesting. Um, like visually, it's you know it's, it's quite. It's quite interesting to see. Mm. Um, I, I I was surprised that in, in 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 what I played of it, it's like how little of it the sort of split there was, you know. And and the most complicated stuff it seemed to be doing was you have the split, and then you can let the spirit realm character kind of take main control, mm-hmm. and you explore just as her. And that's where like the meat of the puzzling was. Like I, I didn't I didn't. F- I, it felt like an idea that was still trying to like justify itself mechanically um, in what I, in what I played. Um, like there are, uh, and, and, and also like I wasn't getting a particularly big read on like what the thematic relationship between the two realms were. It wasn't like you see something in the real world. And then when you look at it in the spirit world, you're like, Oh, that's clever. That's like a, you know, that, you know, yeah. W- w- what this psychologically represents or whatever, you know, like the obvious reference is Silent Hill, but you know, the, the, the kind of two realms there. Um, I mean, I will tell you that you don't really get this. Um, you no, get, uh, like, it's it, just like, it's like, imagine the real world, but everything's made of bones. And you're like, yeah, I, I, I think, I think even like, which goes back to my Marianne talking to herself thing. Like, yeah, there are these people watching can see now, but like, there are these things that you cut these little skin grafts that are held across things. these skin doors. Uh, And I think even the first one, Marianne says like, oh my God, 
skin. And it's like, I can see, I can see the skin. You don't have to say it. It's fine. But yeah, like there's no real, I don't know. It's very loosey goosey. Uh, uh, like it's not like you're going to see, I don't know, a digital clock in the real world and like some grandfather clock in the, the spirit world or something like, oh, something old and dilapidated. Yeah, and whatever. I just, I, I think so many of its problems could be fixed if it just had like, like a feeling of dread over the whole thing. Because I think horror games get away with a lot because you're scared that you don't necessarily have the headspace to sit back and, and like really evaluate it in like granular detail and see its flaws. The problem with this is it's just so slow and, and so kind of flat that you can, all these problems or limitations are just much easier to see and read. Um, where if there was just, like, if it had some big scares early on, just to introduce the idea that, like, this That's is a right. world where scary stuff can happen and you should be on edge. You know, it, it seems to feel that just having an empty, dilapidated building is spooky enough. Or having a world where everything is made of skin is spooky enough, and it isn't. Like, it doesn't need to have combat, it doesn't need to have stealth or chase sequences, it just needs to have a feeling that, like, something horrible is going to happen at any time. And I, I just think that's the... It's just a huge missing ingredient from, it, from this one for me. Yeah, it, it, it does. Like, it's not... It's not scary. <laughs> like, you know? Um, which is quite a problem in a horror game. Um, but uh, at the same time, like what you said about it being the ultimate game pass game. Like I don't, you know, I'm, I'm kind of okay with that in terms of, I didn't really pay, I didn't pay Mm. for it per se. And I downloaded it and I I was playing it on the Xbox series X. Um, and and it's like, it's reasonably shiny. I think on PC, it's, you know, going to have more bells and whistles. I think it's got like ray tracing and all the gubbins and, um, better frame rate and everything. It's quite slow on Xbox, but, um, uh, yeah, like it's, it's, I wasn't like, God damn it. This is offending me. This is so shit or anything. I was just like, ah, yeah, I'll play this on Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Why it, not? It, it's totally, it's all right. It's okay. That's, you know, it's, it's, yeah. Weird. I don't know why yeah. there was so much buzz for it based on like the studio's recent output. Is it like, did the buzz come from the fact that it's, sort of a semi Xbox exclusive. I was just going to say, it was it, kind of, yeah. And it was sort of tied to series X. So they were like, has it, has it got the sheen of a next gen game? Like, obviously that's irrelevant to PC, but I, th- I, I, I think the buzz, like, I think the buzz around it is purely because like you, you can't play this on Xbox one X. It is a, if you're a console player, Xbox um, series X is the only place to play this. So it's, it's one of your few, actual like next gen like how many how many right. next gen games are there it's fuck all yeah so, so like i mean i mean then they're what well, you know they're smart because you get in early when other people haven't made many yeah. games and there's a hunger for it and people will basically eat anything like and they've turned i think yeah. they've even said I, if i paid 40 the, quid for this i'd be i i'd probably feel a bit peeved i think i think they've said they've turned a profit of the are they broken even yeah i think they have yeah i think so, yeah so you know um yeah like like if you have Game Pass, give it a go. You might enjoy it. Like, but I did think the the split reality thing was quite cool, and maybe if that was put in a better game, that would have been good. Uh, but the majority of it is quite okay. Uh, it, it sure is a thing to do for six hours. It is. It is a thing. And you know what? More short games, please, or shorter. You know, Christ Almighty. That was one of the re. That was one of the 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 reasons I actually wanted to play it because I was like, oh, thank Christ. Something that isn't like 20, 30, 40 hours. Give me, <laughs> give me a more focused story and something. And it's like, well, did they give me that? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, Matthew, you've been playing a different game to as well as your two hours of uh, the medium. You've played a game I know very little about and I might even get the name wrong. King Arthur, A Knight's Tale? Is that right? Yes. So what, yeah, what, what um, is this? So uh, I got uh, a little kind of preview code for this. It's actually an early access code. This has been a, this is a Kickstarter sort of tactical RPG from Neocore Games, who you probably know best, if you know them at all, um, from their Van Helsing games, oh, they, yeah. the Adventures of Van Helsing, um, which were like little kind of action RPGs, pretty, pretty you know, tidy little things. 
Um, yeah, this was a big Kickstarter project. Despite being called King Arthur Knight's Tale, you actually play as the villainous Mordred um, at the start of the, the game in this cinematic. King Arthur and Mordred are sort of fighting, and they both die, appear to die, and then you wake up in this sort of uh, sort of fantasy Avalon, which is, you know... It's, I don't know if it's meant to be like the afterlife or something's happened and you've basically escaped death and are now playing as as Mordred and basically building up Camelot and collecting Knights of the Round Table to find uh, King Arthur or kill King Arthur. <laughs> There's not enough of the game okay. in the early yeah. act. You know, it's it's like the first couple of missions. It's a bit mysterious. Um, quite like the cinematic though. It's quite sort of. Um, Lord of the Ringsy. So how, um, how are you? Is it a hack and slash type? No, of it's thing? not. You're seeing when you get into the game proper. Um, this is a basically Arthurian XCOM. I guess is the best oh, way of describing it. Okay. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's it's kind of an isometric RPG in that you click to move around maps and and locations, and you can have conversations with people, and you can you know open chests, pick up items, that kind of stuff. Um, but when it goes into combat, XCOM is probably the the the, the model for it. Right. You know, it has a you know, there's like a cover system. There's grid based movements. You have you know how far you can move without and how far you can move and still do an action. Mm. It's not as clear as it's not as simple as like XCOM's like movement and action um, sort of division. Right. Um, it has like an action point system, which is a bit more like Divinity, um, as you'll see when the combat kicks off. Um, like, again, it's, it's kind of hard, to, it's sort of hard to, to work out where exactly this is going, like, mechanically, because uh, in this demo, anyway, a lot of the combat is, like, hand-to-hand, so the idea of, like, cover, cover and sight lines, um, you know, which you get from XCOM, are... are it's sort of hard to see how they're going to factor in. I did get an archer by the end of the demo I to was, range combat. So there is it, range. But, okay, right. Yeah, but I don't know like the, the true extent of it. Um, in these first two levels, it's pretty generous. Like You've got pretty powerful characters. It's, it's not too difficult, like XCOM. Uh, unlike XCOM, you know, which is quite kind of fierce from the off. Um, it has like permadeath, so the Knights of the Round Table can die permanently in the story, and that'll have a big impact um it has like XCOM kind of if you take enough damage you can get like permanently injured in battle and then it has this sort of um overworld map which you'll see in a second which is the kind of way you select to do missions but you can also kind of build rebuild bits of Camelot which then it's basically like your base in XCOM you know you, you go in there and you can like rest the knights for a mission or you can upgrade different facilities within Camelot. Sorry, facilities. But it's a bit technical for medieval castles. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you know. ev- everything you're you're explaining here is XCOM. Like it is very X. So, what, was there anything yeah. sort of unique about this? Yeah. So between, like I say, between battles, you are walking around, um, chatting with characters. It's got a bit more of an RPG sort of skin on it. You know, you can talk to people. There are like dialogue trees. Um, at a certain after certain key battles, you get like big moral decision. So it's got like an RPG morality thing in it. Like, oh. are you going to like, you know, once you've cleared out these these guys from Camelot, for example, you know, you can like seize it as your throne and be like the ruler, or you can be you can sort of accept more of like a like a guardian role to kind of sort of sort of shepherd the lands and work with the knights of the round table. And then you have a big sort of a morality chart, um, which I don't think I included in this footage, but it has this sort of morality chart that lets you, um, as you push along certain, you know, the axis of, of like, you know, uh, sort of kind and cruel and sort of authoritarian and sort of holistic leadership or whatever, mm. um, you unlock extra stats and buffs. So there's like quite a lot of individual RPG character development. Um, it doesn't feel like XCOM in that it doesn't feel like you're just recruiting generic men and, and training them up. They, and they, renaming they feel them like just members of your family. Like these are characters with Yeah, they feel like characters. I I potentially the couple of interesting things, it feels like it's gonna have a lot of like, 
you know, the decisions that change morality, your moral, moral standing. But I also get the feeling that it's going to have an impact like on branching story. So it's going to have a bit more of an overarching story than XCOM has and the decisions you make can kind of change how the story goes. I also wonder, given that the characters are kind of key story components, like if they die, that will change like the vibe of the story. So that's almost like a, almost a bit more like Fire, Fire Emblem, Emblem mm-hmm. than XCOM. Um, yeah, like, so the challenge with the, uh, this is is making any kind of judgment based on the very early gameplay. I mean, it looks nice enough. I'm a sort of sucker for these isometric worlds. Um, I'm a sucker for tactical combat, even if this is quite kind of easy. And I don't really get the feel of of like how key ranged is going to be in time. But uh, yeah, it seems it seems interesting enough. It seems all right. I you know there there are lots of people who kind of kickstarted it, kind of you know playing and getting their hands on it and and it, i must admit this one had kind of passed me by at that stage mm-hmm. so i'm not entirely sure you know uh how you know like exactly where them? exactly where or how they pitch this um i must admit i played this relatively late in the day to get it into this episode um so normally i'd have researched a bit better but like here for example you can see like some of the the kind of overworldy stuff you can like level up the characters and you've got your little Camelot, and you have to go and do a mission to get like the building resources to build up Camelot. Um, did it seem? Nice. Did it seem relatively deep to you? From what? From what I mean, there's there's quite a lot of busyness to the skill trees and like item crafting, and and I, I imagine once you've opened up Camelot and you've got the facilities, you can push characters in 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 interesting routes. Um, I think in the the sort of the preview code notes I got, I think it said it was aiming for about twenty five hour kind of playthrough time, which is maybe a little shorter than you would get from like a big XCOM campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I wonder if, because it's got like story, big story elements, like the aim is to maybe make something a bit more compact that you can like replay and try different things and see how the story plays out. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. like interesting. I need, like, yeah, I'm a lot more interested. You know, I hadn't really heard of it beforehand, admittedly, but um, having played it now, it's it's like, registered as a oh this could be cool you know i i like these kind of games in the absence of um you know uh, an obvious xcom 3 it's I'm, I'm up for this like last year i felt like we were reasonably well served with gears tactics and i quite liked xcom chimera squad as well um so yeah something like that to kind of fill Fill-able i don't really know what the big i don't really know what the big kind of tactics games are this year this 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 year so to have something in the genre is always nice. <laughs> it's time for mystery steam reviews. Yeah. Yes, mystery steam reviews is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where I, Colin Mahern, and he, Matthew Castle, test the knowledge of one another via steam reviews that are and forever will be, until we reveal the answers, a mystery. The rules are as follows. Both I and Matthew bring three Steam reviews to the MSR arena, but we omit the name of the game associated with each review. Our opponent must correctly guess the game attached to each review. One correct answer equals one point. Uh, While both of us have 90 seconds on each MSR, we both also have help in the form of three lifelines. These lifelines can be used at any stage during battle and also pause the 90 second timer. Each lifeline can only be used once and they are as follows. Question, where the hot seat haver gets to ask a yes or no question. Second opinion, where a second review is given to the warm chair sitter. And genre, where the genre of the game is revealed to the one with the warm arse. Now, Matthew, um, because of all this talk about stocks and Christian Bale, we decided this week to focus on video games that have playable psychics. That's why. Um, so, yeah, it's quite simple, really. Uh, the medium is out, so that's why we're doing that. Uh, but ah, it's, I see your thought process. It's games where the protagonist or one of the playable characters, if it's a fighting game or whatever, uh, where somebody has a playable character has psychic abilities. But, um, again, it can't be a created character like a, a Skyrim or whatever else. Uh, and I think yeah. that's uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. We'll see if there will be arguments about what 
to find a, a character with psychic abilities. Um, <laughs> I think there will be. <laughs> uh, Matthew, would you like your first Mystery Steam review? Yeah, go for it. So emotional, dramatic, and heart-touching. Soundtrack, graphics, characters, and story all perfectly connected into a masterpiece. I just wish I could rewind and play this game for the first time again. And that's from HH. It is recommended 21.1 hours on record, 19.9 hours at review time. Matthew, your time starts now. Okay, interesting. Rewind feels like a key element here. I wish I could rewind and play this game. I don't think, is that, or is that just a turn of phrase? That makes me think it's like a, is that a game where you can rewind time? Is that a psychic ability? Um, uh, very story heavy game. I wish I could experience it all over again. I really liked that psychic story. I wish I could rewind time. If I could turn back time. <laughs> um, hit me up with the genre. Okay, we're going to pause the timer at 49 seconds. And uh, as Matthew uses his genre lifeline. So the genre is, of course, as always, according to wikipedia.org, the <laughs> yeah. genre of this video game is an episodic graphic adventure video game. An episodic graphic adventure video game. Matthew, 49 seconds, your time starts now. Episodic graphic adventure, so a, like a so a kind of playable comic book, like a telltale game. Um, not the, the evil, The Walking Dead doesn't have a psychic in it. Tales from the Borderland doesn't. Um, an episodic, episodic, other episodic games. Oh, Jesus. It's got to be a Telltale game, surely. Not the Wolf Among Us, he's not psychic. Uh, or Batman, he's not psychic. <laughs> this Game of Thrones doesn't have any fucking psychics in it. Ten seconds. Oh, shit, shit, shit. Uh, oh, my God. I, 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 Tales from the Borderlands. I don't know. Fuck it, I don't know. <laughs> I just plucked a Telltale game. So, you knew from the off it was, uh, you know, a uh, story-driven. I think the review mentioned something about emotional story, dramatic. And you picked up on that rewind time thing. You were like, this this can't... This must be something. Oh, no! This must be it's something. fucking life is strange. It's fucking life is strange. Piss. You, you got the lifeline, oh, which, of you course... Pisser. You used you your piss, genre... piss. Piss. You used your genre Imagine lifeline, said that on, which on <laughs> you used your genre like, lifeline, oh, no. which of course <laughs> uh, was an episodic graphic adventure video game. So you thought, aha, this must be Telltale, but it can't be Batman. It can't be um, The Walking Dead. Let's just let's just throw Tales from the Borderlands out there. Well, he sees a ghost in it. Matthew. He sees the cancer jar. I don't know if that counted as a psychic power. Fuck! I can tell you that the correct answer is... His fucking life is strange. Nice one. His fucking life is strange. Of course it is. Hey, why does it say it's 2-1 to you? Oh, it shouldn't. Whoops. I meant to... <laughs> I meant to update those. Unless you those. used your psychic abilities to see the end score. <laughs> oh, that'd be quite good. I hope I, I hope I have done. Sorry, it is oh, nil God. nil is the current score. Shit! Uh, of course, it's life is strange. She she is indeed able to rewind time. Oh God! How did I not see that? That's so easy. I'm such an idiot. Um, Matthew, let's see how much of an idiot. Let's see how much of an idiot I am. Could I have my first mystery Steam review? Please. What a letdown. Half-baked, unoptimized mess. Far removed from the XCOM universe we're all used to. Crappy cartoon-style cinematics and the dumbed-down gameplay mechanics are simply terrible. Anarch 111, not recommended, 0.2. You know what, Cullum? I, for I forgot to remove a keyword from this. <laughs> <laughs> Time starts now. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, god damn it! God no. damn it! <laughs> what could this be? Well, see, the thing is... 
crappy cartoon style. Like that. So I'm thinking XCOM Chimera Squad. There was, um, oh, what's the name of it? The Bureau XCOM Declassified. That didn't have cartoony cinematics. XCOM War 2 War of the Chosen was DLC. So I'm not sure what our rules are on that. Uh, this must be XCOM Chimera Squad. <laughs> Unless do I use a lifeline to make sure. No. That has cartoon cinematics like. I, I'm i going to say XCOM Chimera Squad, Chris. Is that your final answer? That is indeed my final answer. So, you had this very difficult clue, which I forgot to remove a keyword from, thus exposing this as a XCOM game, but not a mainstream XCOM game. That gave you two XCOM games to choose from. <laughs> the Bureau <laughs> or XCOM Chimera Squad, which has cartoon cinematics. The correct answer is... XCOM Chimera Squad! Oh, what a fucking mistake that was. My prediction of a 2-1 victory is, uh, <laughs> it uh, may come through. That is... Oh my god. What a, what a schoolboy error. It would have been quite a good clue if you put, like, brackets game series there. I would have been trying yeah, to... Yeah, that's what I was going to do. Um, Matthew, tr redeem yourself. Uh, here is your second mystery Steam review. I expected more of game name, but it turned out to be a regular FPS. That's from The Prophet, but the O's are zeros and the E's are threes because The Prophet is dead cool. Uh, it is not recommended. 3.6 hours on record, 1.8 hours at review time. Matthew, your time starts now. Uh game name, but it turned out to be an FPS, so they thought it was going to be part of a series. They thought, oh, right, it's going to be more like that, but it got turned into just a sh dumb first-person shooter, a regular FPS, anyway. Uh, give me the second opinion on this. Okay, we're going to pause the timer at 1.10. And uh, your lifeline, uh, you're looking for the second opinion. Right, the second opinion of this video game is as follows. Um, from Hoodwink, Maine. Uh, this, uh, they say, Wow, this game is a cheap rip-off of Soma. This game is a cheap rip-off of Soma. Your timer restarts now. Okay. Play a psychic. I thought it was going to be more of this, but it's a first-person... It's more of a regular FPS. Well, that puts it in the realms of so I, I thought it was going to be more amnesia. Uh, does that mean it's it's not an FPS? I wouldn't say I, the, any the, of those the, horror the, games. The, the clue was I, I expected more of game name. Not I expected more game name. I expected more of this game. Right. Oh, right, but it's more of a a regular FPS. Soma. But then Soma isn't a regular FPS. That doesn't make any sense. That's why it's, our second opinion hasn't helped me at all. Um, Ten seconds. Oh, God, but you play a psychic. You can see a... Uh, I don't know. If everyone's gone to the rapture, I don't know. You can see ghosty people in that. Oh, fuck it. I'm useless at this. <laughs> I'm fucking useless at this. <laughs> so, um, clearly from the review, you were like, right, so somebody, ex you know, they were thinking this game was going to be one thing, but it turned out to be an FPS. The clue. It's not. Oh, I have no uh, idea. The, what the this sec is. second opinion mentioned how uh, it, it, this game was a cheap rip off of Soma. Which, uh, Rapture isn't... Oh, what a terrible guess. And clutching at straws, you indeed ended up on Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. Matthew, I can tell you that the correct answer is... Bioshock. You've just been so mad, my friend. I, <laughs> I, 
I really thought the second opinion would give it away instantly. Oh, I didn't. I, I remembered like we had all that Soma business, but in back, I couldn't quite pit my finger on what, what we dick each other over with when we say Soma. I forgot that it's fucking Bioshock. I just got Bioshock, the oldest mystery Steam review trick in the book. Oh. Um, you were psychic in that. Well, you have psychic abilities. You can have psychic abilities. What are your psychic abilities? Uh, I wrote this down because I knew you would question it. Um, <laughs> so you can hypnotize the big daddies. Uh, you can have telekinetic powers. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad I wrote that down now. Uh, Matthew, uh, could I have my second mystery steam review, please? Expect plenty of clicking through conversations. What kept me going were the lovable characters, the insane plot twists, and the offbeat humour. That's from Mr. Broke. Recommended with 50.1 hours on record, but only 45.8 at the time of review. Okay, time starts now. Uh, okay, loads of conversations, lovable characters, insane plot twists. So what's funny, it has lovable characters and lots of conversations. Lots of conversations. Um, so... Your kind of CRPG, like Divinity, Disco Elysium. Um, oh, what's the other one? Pillars of Return, all that kind of shite. Um, I'm going to... Or Mass Effect? Lovable characters? It's the comedy, though. Uh, I'm going to pause the timer at 49 seconds. And I am going to ask... Genre would help me here, unless you're just going to tell me like an isometric RPG, which may be the case. But yeah, could I have my genre, please, Matthew? Let's try with that. See if that helps me. Yeah. Uh. Visual novel adventure game. Ooh, uh, restarting the timer now, 49 seconds. What? So that takes away all of my RPG stuff. A visual novel adventure game. Humor. Is this Tales from the Borderlands? Is that why you were thinking of that? A visual novel. It's not a visual novel. A visual novel adventure game. You have psych, but the playable character has psychic abilities. Oh shit! Can't think of anything. Visual novels. Um, Catterful boyfriend. Um, oh, dream daddy. Uh, nine seconds. Oh shit! Are you a psychic pigeon and Catterful boyfriend? Maybe. Uh, sure. Catterful boyfriend. Is that your final answer? That's my final answer, Chris. Why not? So you had lots of guesses. You were thrown a little bit by a pick of genre that has revealed this to be a visual novel adventure game. You've gone for Hatto Full Boyfriend, the pigeon dating game, but is one of the pigeons psychic? <laughs> or are you psychic? I don't know. Do you play as a pigeon in that game? I'm uh, not yeah, sure. I think you do, yeah. The correct answer is... Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney Trilogy. Shit. Just to justify it, he has a little magical rock that lets him see people's psychological locks. That is, they're called psych locks. That I sounds psychic to me. It sounds psychic, yeah. I'm enjoying this, like, justifying the picks. This, <laughs> this is making it extra fun. Uh, Matthew... Your third and final mystery steam review to draw. Am I going to get that one point that was pre preordained? Let's see. <laughs> uh, here it is. Two points. Story is short and well structured. You get to play as a cat also, so it's a win-win situation. That's from Lazy Ninja. It is recommended. Nine point three hours on record. Matthew, your time starts now. Hmm. <sighs> Story is short and you get to play as a cat. Nine hours. It's not that short. Um, play as a cat. Oh, what? Um, Do you have your, your question lifeline remaining? Yeah. Um, um, 
tricky this one. I'm trying to think of games where you play as cats, and I haven't really where you can kind of possess a cat maybe and move it around. Maybe a game. Is there a game where you can possess a cat? Well, I'll ask a question. Okay, pause the timer. 36 seconds. What is your question, Matthew? Do you play as a cat for the whole game? No. Right, okay. So uh, so restarting the timer. 36 seconds. No. So you can control a cat for a bit of it. Oh, there's that detective game where you're the ghost. Can you control a cat in that? That sort of has a, I have a vague image of being a cat in... Um, it had a t it had a pun name like death by the ghost 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 detective. No, it's not ghost trick. Um, Ten seconds. Uh, soul suspect. S murdered soul suspect. Is that your final answer? Yeah, that's my final answer. So, after learning from this review that you get to play as a cat. Very cleverly used one of your quest your question lifeline and asked, is that a permanent thing? Do you always play as a cat? The answer is no. Which has led you to Square Enix's 2013, 14-ish uh, murdered soul suspect, where indeed you play as a detective and you are able to possess a cat. But is it the right answer? The correct answer, Matthew, is... Murder Soul Suspect! Yes! That's my one point. There's your one point for that prediction As to come through. As foretold! <laughs> well, uh, good work, good work. Um, Murder Soul Suspect was certainly a video game that came out okay. a number of years ago. Um, Can we defy fate and have this as a one all draw? <laughs> Matthew, could I have my third and final Mystery Steam review? Please. The only game where an entire quest can be solved by talking to a deer. I didn't like the way isometric games looked. Then I played this. Now I love it all so much. That's from Geralt of Rivia. The Geralt of Rivia. Recommended 2.2 hours on record. Time starts now. All right, so this is where I can bring back all my CRPG thinking, surely, if it's isometric. You talk to a deer. Oh, what? Is that uh, all right? Well, look, we're going to pause the timer at one eleven. Matthew, could I have my second opinion, please? Second opinion is: I walked up to a creepy necromancy lady in a cave. She asked to kiss me. I allowed her. She filled my mouth with bees and pain. Sure, uh, that hasn't helped me one bit. Uh, restart the timer now. Um, <laughs> right, so it's clearly a bit kooky, quirky, different. You could say that about any of them, really. That could be a, like a fantasy. Uh... I'm going to pause the timer. Oh, am I? Yeah, I'm going to pause the timer 46 seconds and I'm going to use my question. And I am going to ask, <laughs> uh, is this game an RPG that released in the last five years? Yes. Okay. Uh, restart the timer now. So five years ago. Uh... That. Oh shit, has that helped me? <laughs> uh, I'm just. Oh, I have 30 seconds, right? So. I, yeah, Divinity, Disco Elysium, um, uh, Pillars of Eternity, um, what's the other one? Torment. Oh, Jesus. See, like, I know all these fucking names. Talk to a deer. See, like, I know. You, like, the games you love are Divinity. Disco Elysium. It came out in the last five years. Disco Elysium is quite kooky and different and whatever else. Uh, Disco Elysium! Is that your final answer? Yes. 
Yes. So you'll be looking for a kooky game because you can talk to a deer. I think. Just go at least it's, it's a kooky game. There's some kookiness in it. Are you a psychic detective? Are you a psychic detective in Disco Elysium? You have powers that could maybe be read as psychic. Like intellect and steer. Interesting. Let's see. Let's see if I decided the detective from Disco Elysium <laughs> counted as a psychic character. The correct answer is... Divinity Original Sin 2. Shit. Fate was escaped. Ah. Shit, this sounded way more, again, for lack of a better word, kooky than Divinity oh, Original Divinity Sin. Divinity Original Sin 2 is quite famously kooky. Is and it has more animals. Yeah, you can talk to animals. And you could talk to the dead. That's why I put it in, because I know you're a little bit like RPG characters who you can make into psychics don't count. But every character can has like a has psychic, psychic built into them in this. So I thought it counted. I, th I think that counts. Yeah, I think that counts. Uh, much happier with this Mr. Steam reviews this week. It's a lot more If you watched all, however many episodes of our Divinity Original Sin 2 Let's Play, you would have got it like that. Would have got it like that. You would have got it like this. Sure. But, uh, but, you know. And that's weird, because when, when uh, we interviewed for you for this job, mm -hmm. way back when, I said, have you watched all of our Divinity Let's Play? I said play? twice. And you said, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Twice. I was actually. I, I think. I think I said I was on my third watch through of well, it. Yeah. Uh, that's obviously bullshit. Complete lie. Complete lie. Yeah. Complete lie. Mm -hmm. That's how you play the mystery well. steam reviews. I was training for mystery steam reviews even back then. <laughs> Yes, I forget sometimes about the screaming man being burnt alive. <laughs> uh, yes, it is time for uh, Burning Questions, part of the PC Gaming Week Spot, where we turn to you, Week Spot viewers and listeners and consumers, for your indeed burning questions. Uh, you can reach us at any stage throughout the week and email us weekspot at rockpapershotgun.com. And then we may read out your correspondence on the show. Matthew. Uh, we have uh, a decent amount of correspondence, as they say, from the lovely people. Uh, oh, let's get this. Let's do. Let's do them all. Uh, ooh, will we? We'll try. We'll try get through all these. So the first one is from Mog. Mog, who gave us tenor uh, when watching the version on YouTube. Mog, thank you very much. I know we say it every week, but you're brilliant. You're just a brilliant human being. Uh, Mog said, "What are your favorite meat substitute products?" if any. For example, corn, Thai, aromatic bites, and so on. Any interest in meat substitutes, Matthew? Uh, I've been eating uh, vegetarian sausages during lockdown. Linda McCartney? Linda McCartney, very nice. Makes a fine sausage, she does, yeah. Um, I've also been eating uh, vegetarian meatballs, which I can't remember if they're also... Are they, are, they the, are they in a green packet? Are they bird's eye? No, they're not bird's eye, they're... Or not, or what the fuck are they? Or uh, not bird's eye, green... Oh, because I, I thought I was going to say them. Those meatballs are, oh, mwah, phenomenal. They're in a green packet. Uh, I can't think of them. The corn meat, meatballs are all right, but those ones specifically are Oh, no, they're, they're, these are also Linda McCartney vegetarian meatballs. Ooh. It's basically like stuffing, like, you know, roast chicken, you know, like mm -hmm. stuffing you have with your roast. Um, yeah, I've been getting quite into those. Um, though actually, we, we went a bit too heavy on the vegetarian stuff, and now we're on a bit of a like mad meat bender. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, we're really going big on the meat all of a sudden, like to to bring back balance to the universe. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I I suppose I I am that annoying person that you would call a flexitarian. I suppose I eat. Like, I will have vegetarian stuff a lot and then, like, the occasional meat thing. Um, I but, think that's just, that is, that's just normal. Oh, I don't think it's normal. I think that's... Just, I, I, yeah, but, like, I eat both meat and vegetarian things. That's, like, does that need a special name? I think, You're just a normal person. You're not special, Cullum. I Accept it. I think... You're just boring like the rest of us. I don't think if you, if you ask the average person on the street, they're having normal sausages. They're not having Linda McCartney sausages. 
I would there be are loads of confident. people. That's that's like saying like I eat meat all the time, and I, I then I had a vegetable I say soup. This. That doesn't make I me a say... flexitarian. That just makes me a regular human being. I will say that I think the two of us are regular human beings for people in the games industry. I think if you ask Joe Blogs on the street, they're not eating corn, basically. Uh, but what do you I. Think? You think you think that's specific to games journalists that they I, eat corn? I I think it's specifically to to the type of person in the games industry. Yes, I do. Yeah. Oh. Um. But uh, don't you pigeonhole me? I'm regular. I don't think you I'm are. I'm a regular um, normal dude. But yeah, I but, eat regular normal dude things. There's there's <laughs> like Linda McCartney sausages. Uh, there are loads of like vegetarian meat substitute stuff. There's loads of like very nice things. Gone are the okay. days when it was just pure shite. Um, Elias got in touch and Elias said, after hearing all the praise for Hitman 3 the other week, I got the first two on special and they are as fun as they sounded. I'm through, I've I've played through all the levels in the first game a couple of times now and I'm looking to crack on with the second game. So my question is, what is your favourite level from the first two games and why? This is why earlier, Matthew, I said for you to... Um, talk about your Hitman levels piece now. So talk about it now. So I have just done a feature where I list all the levels in the correct order, 100% correct. You cannot argue with it. Anyone who argues with it is a fool and I will never respect them. So um, be- because of that, what your what are your first... Your my, your f- my, my number one level is from Hitman 1 and it is Hokkaido, the sixth and final level in Hitman 1. It's my favorite stage in all of Hitman's. Um, uh, it's, well, you should read the feature, really. It's, <laughs> it's, it's got a lot of Hitman thoughts. But my second favorite level, I think, is uh, Miami from Ooh, Hitman 2. I was going to I think Miami's my favorite, I would say, from the first two games. I really, really like Miami. I had some people in the comments saying that this was wrong and that Sapienza should be number one. Sapienza, Sapienza, is, Sapienza, Sapienza is the cliched number one. That's any list you find online. Sapienza. They'll put Sapienza. It's too easy to put that at number one and it's got problems because it makes you destroy this virus at the end, which means that no matter how much fun you have in Sapienza, and it's a lot of fun, but no matter how much fun you're having, when you get to the end, that level's bad. It's bad at the end. Sapienza is one hundred percent the cliched answer. Yeah, I, I mean, Sapienza is still still good. Uh, but it's yeah, great. My, it's in my top ten for sure. My, I mean, the truth. Sorry, no, I was I was just going to say Miami is because uh, that's the first level in Hitman Two, isn't it? It yeah. is. Yeah, like, no, no, second. Hawks Bay. Oh, Hawks Bay. Level. Well, that's kind of tutorially. No, no, no. The ICA facility is the tutorial. Um, yeah, I suppose. Um, oh. but uh, <laughs> yeah, my Miami is. I think even we spoke about it a couple of weeks ago. Like how, like how broad and big and alive it is. Like when it comes to like the racetrack, the the aquarium me bit. Like just kind of walking around the concourse, like. It just feels, yeah, just so alive and there's so much to do there. Uh, a little kind of an honourable mention, though, to Whittleton Creek from Hitman 2. I love that level. Now, my affection for that level might be, artif- well, not artificially inflated, but like, because I didn't play essentially the original version of that, uh, which was in Blood Money, I think, isn't it? Um I, my affection for Whittleton Creek maybe is uh, larger than somebody who did play the original version. It is, I really like it, that. It, it is good though. Again, if you read the list feature, you'll, you'll, you'll hear my thoughts. I think it's a little too sedate, a little too easy. Okay. Okay. Uh, for well, yeah. how much fun stuff there is in that level, I don't think it all like necessarily comes into play. But So yeah, go, go have a read of that for all 21 of them uh, ranked. Uh, Matt got in touch. Matt brackets that, not that one, they tells us. Uh, is that me? Hello. Is that must be like, I think he's so. trying to tell us that it's not me getting in touch. I think so. I think so, yeah. Uh, Matt said, hello, chaps. What is your favourite creative use of a map in a game? I'm quite fond of the maps in Hollow Knight, where you have to report back to, uh, report back to a map NPC once you've explored an area. It forces you to explore and remember the layout yourself when first exploring an area. 
and there's some in-game logic to how the, your character has a map. The Etrian Odyssey series also forced you to draw your own maps in-game, but that's not PC, so talking about that is probably banned. Cheers, Matt. You're correct, it is banned, and you can never email in again. I'm joking. That is, email Etrian Odyssey is, great, is a great, great series. Uh, good, thank you very series. much. Uh, thank you very much for that, Matt. Uh, your favourite... I mean, it feels like there's kind of a lot of layers going on in this question, but what's your favourite, like, a character just, like, reasoning for a map? Or, because, like, one that comes to my mind is, even though it's a game that I can take or leave, to be honest, but some people absolutely adore it, is Sea of Thieves. I love the 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 reasoning behind the in-game map and that, and how, like, whenever you want to see wherever you're going, you have to go to the big, large map, or when you're walking around an island, you pull a map open in front of you. I, yeah, I love that. I think that's, that's good. Definitely. See if these is very strong. Um, weirdly in, a little indie game I played recently, Carto. Oh yeah. Um, where you collect map segments and then you piece the map together and how you piece it together basically recalibrates the world. So, you know, if you want to make a lake, you can get four map pieces, which have got like coast and then, link them together to make a lake and then a fish might come out. And it's, it's all about like people give you directions to say, Oh, I think this guy was like left of these trees. If you follow that path and then you rebuild the map so that there's a house left of the trees, if you follow the path and then the man will appear in the house and stuff. So it's kind of a, a map based puzzle game. Um, in terms of maps in game, uh, I, uh, I like the like. I like having to physically bring up a map, like your Far Cry Two, um, uh, Metro Exodus did it as well. I think, um, yeah, good map, good maps, good maps, good maps. All Joel, give me one word answer. Joel asked, "Who would be your non Bioware developer of choice to make a new Knights of the Old Republic?" I'm going to say double fine. Uh, Larian? I like Larian RPGs. Um, Diogo got in touch. Diogo said, what's a game you pick up from time to time and play for a bit and rarely finish? Just for the memories it holds for you. I never do that. Do you do that with any games? Just pick it up and play it for a bit? Yeah, some Nintendo games. Like, not super, super... Like, I'll still play Chunks of Galaxy just because it's like, reminds me how much I love that game. Um... Yeah. I don't really know how people have time to, like... No, I mean, that's not sit there and play the whole thing, but... It's like, just play I, the I first... Get, like, yeah, I get nostalgic pangs for certain, like, missions and bits of things. Grim Fandango, there's sequences in that I really like watching. Maybe I'll just rewatch them on YouTube, though. <laughs> um, and Antaracel asks, uh, is there a universally beloved game that you really never enjoyed? Possibly something embarrassing to admit in public. It's Undertale for me, and I can hear the booze coming my way. Thank you, Aunt Uh Any video game that is beloved, everyone fucking loves it, but Matthew Castle is sitting there being all curmudgeon-like and is like, I don't like this video game at all. Uh, I feel that way about some of the From Software stuff. Like, I just really okay. bounce off it. Uh, Hollow Knight, I don't get it at all. Like, I love Metroidvanias, and that one leaves me very very cold Hello. um yeah, it does um and it drives me up the wall because i've got loads of friends who've had like seemingly near religious experiences playing it but not me <laughs> um, <laughs> um like see i don't know i i could say like minecraft like i just boring yeah there's no things thanks. where i can see like, that but there's things where i can see the appeal and it's just not for me and then there are things where i literally don't get like and i'll tell you another one horizon zero dawn right okay the like, people who think that's like a 10 i don't get that at all that's like i do not dig that world that car i love the fiction of it none of it does it for me yeah see i suppose like i don't i don't really mess around with games where i create my own fun anyway I'm Mm. You make the fun for me and I'll judge the fun that you have made. Thank you. Um, so like, yeah. Um, yeah. But if that isn't just being like, oh, I'm contrarian. Aren't I interesting? I don't like Hollow Knight. I don't think, you know, I wish I did like it. I'm envious of people who've had a great time with it. But for me, 
That's it. We we want all the video games to be lovely, but sadly they're not. Yeah. Not all of them can be lovely. Uh, Chris got in touch. Uh, Chris said, writing to you guys from Guyana, South America. Uh, Chris says, with uh, Valentine's Day around the corner, what would you each choose as one of the best romantic relationships in video games? Keep up the good work. Thank you, Chris. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'd call it one of the best. Well, no, I would, because it is quite personal. Like, you know, a romance in a Mass Effect. A romance in, like, any RPG, I suppose, because of that personal investment in the character and all the sexy yeah. aliens that you can write. Um, but one game that I, that impressed me when I played it was Florence. Do you ever play Florence? Uh, no, no, I, I know. But um, like that, I, I suppose the relationship in that purely because of how real it is, you know, it is, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it just, it, it feels like a, um, something plucked from reality, basically. It's very, very factual-based relationship, uh, very relatable. It's very good. It is very good. Yeah, is it, but, but in terms of, like, fucking magical and whatever else, then, yeah, Mass Effect. I don't know. Yeah, I don't... I've never really had that kind of closer relationship with any video game character. I don't really fall in love with video game characters. I don't, really, I don't even really fancy them. I think all the ones I did in Mass Effect were just very cynical. Uh, um, um, I don't, I don't know. That's okay. I I gave. I it's gave tricky. Two I tell answers. you what, there was a, a, a weird little moment in. Uh, uh, there was actually some stuff in Cyberpunk, not the actual romances, but some of the pre-existing relationships between some of the other characters. I thought were very well observed and had a very like wistful nostalgia, which I thought was quite romantic. I think mm-hmm. there was some stuff in that game where you're working with um, Rogue, the kind of fixer, yeah. and you kind of like take her to some old places she used to go with, like Johnny Silverhand, and you bring up like Johnny Silverhand's car, and she she kind of her sort of hard exterior cracks for a second when she sees the car, and she's just like. She can't believe it. You know, it's like she's, you know, 25 again or something. And that's a, that's a very romantic notion. Um, yeah, I liked, but, I liked that, um, actually. The rogue. The, but it the didn't have enough car chases in it. It didn't. <laughs> Total bullshit. Uh, Jonathan got in touch. Bullshit. Jon- Jonathan lived to die. <laughs> Jonathan asked, what is one feature that, in your opinion, the new IOI Bond game absolutely must include? Just give me one that, like, if it doesn't have this... It is total bullshit. Car chases. Uh, quips. Oh, I think it needs some form of. Uh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I don't. I'm not. Don't know how you do it because I don't even know what Bond is in 2021. But I suppose some sort of like flirt um, button. It needs you know because he's suave. Like it, it needs to differentiate him from like the cold and calculating Agent 47. I. I want to get an achievement for stroking Blofeld's cat. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you said cat. Uh, and someone has, to, someone has to say, I've been expecting you, Mr. Bond. Ross got in touch. Ross said, I imagine that when you were younger, you had limited access to new games. Is there a game from your childhood that you adored that you can look back on and confidently say was Bobbins? Not just Bobbins by today's standards, but would have been seen as Bobbins back when it came out. Uh, yeah, from Ross. Thank you, Ross. A game from your childhood that was shit. Uh, I bought a game called Heads, What's which that? was like a, a kind of combat game where you were an alien and you collected heads. And when you put on a head, you became that character. And there were like 300 heads to get in the game. And it was basically just like an arena shooter with these heads. Um, but for some reason, like when I was, you know, a kid or, a, you know, 12 or whatever, mm-hmm. If on the back of the box it was like three hundred playable characters, like, I'd oh, be yeah. like, "Oh fuck, amazing!" Like I was really won over by like big numbers on things. Um, but that game was not very good. Um, yeah, uh, I, um, games that come to my mind. Uh, 
are oh I thought of an answer for an earlier question about the beloved game Final Fantasy they're all rubbish uh, but yeah this one um, my answer for this question is anything Sonic the Hedgehog after the Mega Drive <laughs> Um, yeah. Sonic Heroes, and, Shadow the Hedgehog. I remember with I bought Sonic Heroes for PlayStation Two. Sonic I, Heroes, um, Sonic Heroes. Could I have been? I don't know what age. Would I have been thirteen, fourteen, maybe? So we're stretching what child means. Um, but like, and even I, I remember at the time my friend saying, "This is fucking rubbish." And me saying, you just can't handle the speed, lads. You just can't handle how fast it is. You just gotta just gotta get better, basically. Gotta get good. Cause Sonic Heroes is where the Sonic franchise is headed. I was blinded by love uh, because Sonic Heroes is mock, uh, as is Shadow the Hedgehog. Um when actually prior to that, because yeah, that was on PlayStation 2. Do you remember the South Park games, Matthew? South Park, Chef's, oh, boy, how, Chef's Love Shack oh, and yeah. South Park Rally. Oh, I, there was a terrible South Park first-person shooter That's on the, the N64. It was called South Park and it was shit. And I bought that with my own money and I tried to convince myself because that came out when I was 10, I want to say, ish, 10, 11. And so I was the prime age for South Park, loved it. Pissing in snowballs, fantastic! <laughs> and I but just you can throw like Mr. Hanky, the Christmas bird yeah. people. Oh, I'm throwing lumps of shit at people. This is the height of comedy. Uh, it was rubbish. Chef's Love Shack, which was the quiz follow-up, rubbish. South Park Rally, one of the worst rally games you'll um, or not rally. Uh, it was a, a kart racing game. Awful, absolutely horrendous. Um, do you have any any others come to mind, Matthew? Not really. I mean, I'm sure there was some terrible junk in there. Games were so expensive and rare. Like we only got them for birthday and Christmas that we yeah. tended to do our research. So actually I had a pretty killer N64 collection and likewise on PC. It was mostly point and click adventures. Um, I must admit, I played some point and click adventures that were probably not as good um, or aren't as as like fondly thought of. Things like uh, Simon the Sorcerer, um, which I think was okay, actually. I don't think it was terrible, but like, if you like point and click games in the in the late nineties, you you would definitely play some shit at some point. <laughs> uh, and Jack got in touch. Jack said, "Long time listener, first time caller. What with yeah. Chris? What with Christmas just passed? I think this might be a small but old, but we are clearing the docket." Uh, Jack said, "Which biscuit is the king slash queen of the selection box?" Your favourite, so I'm get, yeah, I suppose Jack isn't asking like Victoria or Foxes or whatever. I think Jack is asking the biscuit, the, when you have the pick of any biscuit, what do you go for? Uh, I don't like biscuit variety boxes. They're disgusting. They're <gasps> all disgusting. Oh my God, you've broken me, Matthew. I cannot believe the words are coming out of your... I don't like them. They, they are... Dis- they are look, whenever they- someone's got one of them, they, they are so... They are the most cursed of all the sweet snacks. It's the Fo- biscuit variety Fox's box. box of biscuits dash Matthew Castle um, quotation marks disgusting. Disgusting. I don't like, no, because they're all dry, they're just dry biscuits. It's just like variations on, like, do you want like 20 different versions of a shitty rich tea? No, thank you. It's just all shortbread. I'm devastated. It's not all shortbread. What biscuits are you getting? It's not all shortbread. <laughs> Jesus wept. There are some phenomenal, <laughs> there's, I love the white chocolate one in Victoria, which is like this sort of ovally shaped and it has, um, I don't know, I can't remember what it's called in Bake Off, but the piping along the sides. Uh, there is a Fox's one that has a little hole in the middle, a big, thick chocolate and biscuit. There are so many. Jam and cream, even if you want to go from the family circle variety of biscuits. You have broken my heart, Matthew. You really have. Uh, but we have cleared the docket, which has healed my heart, so that's good. Which means we need your burning questions. So do please get in touch. Weak spot at rockpapershotgun.com. Email us loads more questions and whatnot because, yeah, we've we've totally cleared it. Uh, which means it is time 
to start winding this thing down. Uh, thank you very much, as always, to everyone who sent in all of your burning questions, your feedback, as I say. Do get in touch. But if you want more weak spottiness, uh, there are other ways to get it. You can follow myself and Matthew on social media. I am at Colin underscore Hearn. Matthew is at Mr. Basil underscore Pesto. If you want to talk to some like-minded people, get on Discord, discord.gg forward slash rock, paper, shotgun. Also, if you want to watch the PC Gaming Week spot, head to youtube.com forward slash rock, paper, shot. Uh, you can do all the youtube stuff, like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell, and then be notified of whenever any videos go live there. But if you want the audio version, subscribe to the PC Gaming Week spot via all your podcatching apps, such as Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Player FM, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and so on. But for all of your PC gaming needs, keep it on rockpapershotgun.com. Another weak spot down, Matthew. Uh, thank God we got away without mentioning much about the GameStop stocks, which by the time people watch this, it may the situation may have changed dramatically anyway. So, you know, just watch, I don't know, The Machinist or The Prestige or one of other Christian Bale's terrific works. Uh, but now it is time for my least favourite part of the show. This is the part of the show must bid the listener, viewer, the consumer adieu. So say goodbye, Matthew Castle. Goodbye. And say goodbye, Colin Hearn Sloan. Guffaw. <laughs>